Over the last 15 years, tennis has grown from an exclusive country club activity to a sport for the masses. And as the amateurs have increased, so have the number of professional players and injuries. Whether you play for fun or for money, to enjoy the sport, you have to stay healthy. Bob Russo, the trainer for the U.S. Open and the Tournament of Champions, has some tips he gives the pros that can also help us. Stretching is probably the most important preventative medicine that we prescribe. It seems, in my experience with athletes, not only in tennis but other sports, that the players who stretch the most are usually less injury prone. The weather is perfect, the players in shape, and the tennis should be nothing but fun. But sometimes a problem can develop in a joint or muscle that's not really an injury, but a major annoyance. In tennis, the players play every day. They can't send in substitutions for themselves. They're under a lot of uh, stress, their bodies always. Uh, in baseball, pitchers may pitch once every six days. Where in tennis, you don't have that. You know, you have players going out and maybe playing three and a half or four hours in a match. and. Uh, have to go out the very next day and play again. Whereas uh, in, in a sport like baseball, you don't have that. It's unheard of where a pitcher will pitch two days in a row. So in tennis, we, we do treat more conditions than injuries. What can you recommend for someone with a knee condition? Well, the knee being the most complicated joint in the body, every knee injury is usually different. It's always best to consult a doctor. It's best to build up the muscles surrounding the knee you know, through a weight program or through stretching and exercise is always important. You know, to keep it warm, a, a massage or a patella mobilization prior to the event uh, is, is helpful in many cases. With an ankle injury, uh, it's important that we use some preventive measures to alleviate any more stress that you're going to put on the ankle. Uh, taping, warm-ups, a whirlpool is very good. And then, you know, possibly if you can do some self-massage uh, is, is helpful because it increases the blood flow to that area. The most common ailment among amateurs is the claim to tennis elbow. Well, tennis elbow is a pretty catch-all phrase. Everybody seems to experience it. Preventively, like to keep the elbow as warm as possible, you know, before a player goes out, you know, getting some, you know, increase this blood flow to that area. He'll go out and play, you know, warm it up, stretch it out, and then when he comes in, ice it down immediately. We have a very, very special guest with us here today. He's going to spend uh, the entire hour with us. We have a unique individual. His name is Bob Russo. He is the uh, trainer for the uh, United States Tennis Association. I just want to say hello to Bob. Good afternoon. Hi, Bob. Hi, Hi Bob. How you doing there? Doing great. Bob's a very... Uh, has a very special position with the United States Tennis Association here. He's the athletic trainer, um, and I think I'm going to let him just explain a little bit. What is the job of the athletic trainer? Well, it's a good question. Um, when you come into an arena and they ask you what you do, you tell them you're the trainer, and they, don't, they say, well, who do you train? You know, they don't actually know what that is. I mean, boxing, a trainer has a different role. Than, but quite generally, we just take care of all the physical needs of the player, whether he's injured or whether he's training in some kind of specialized program or you know injury happens on the court preventative rehabilitative we have the sole responsibility for taking care of his health now does that mean like when i see like on these football games a, a player goes down everybody runs out onto the field is that what the trainer would do he would run out there and and, and you know get an idea what's wrong with we're them. the first line of care that the, right. that the player an injured player would have to deal with yeah before okay. they call in the physician and so on and so forth. We're the first line of, uh, of, uh, of a medical person that you'll see on the field. Uh -huh. Okay, so you actually work in conjunction with, with the doctors as far as taking care of the, uh, the athlete. Exactly. Yeah. Well, in tennis, the trainer is the only person allowed on the court. Once a doctor comes out on the court, the match is automatically uh, declared over. So uh, if the trainer can't handle that problem, then the player is for forced to default. Mm -hmm. But it's a different in every sport. How'd you pick this field there? Well, I always had an interest in sports and sports medicine. And when I got out of um, Long Island University with my master's, I was always a great Jet fan. And I had called um, the Jets to talk to the trainer, who I, I only knew from the television. His name was uh, Jeff Schnedeker. And 
the, the, the woman in the office says, well, he's no longer with us. And she, for whatever reason, gave me his home number, and I called him at home, and I said, Mr. Schnedeker, I said, I was calling you just to see if, uh, if I could come down to the locker room, and, you know, I'll do whatever it takes. I'll pick up towels. I just want to see how you work. And he also explained that he was no longer with the Jets, and he had taken a job with the Cosmos, and he didn't need anybody. So I said, well, if, uh, just so I didn't waste the call, would you take my number? And he reluctantly took it, and, and that was it. And about two months later, I got a call, and he said, uh, Russo? I said, yeah, he said, this is uh, Jeff Schnedeker. I'm with the Cosmos. I need somebody to start work tomorrow. Now, are you already an athletic trainer at the time? I was, I was already an athletic trainer at the time. I just got out of school and just had just got my certification. So you were just hanging around in the living room uh, looking for something to do? And I, mean, I thought it was a joke. I thought somebody was playing a joke. I mean, everybody knew I was a Jet fan. Everybody knew that I had made the call. So uh, he told me, uh, come tomorrow at 10 o'clock to Giant Stadium. And um, I, I reluctantly went out there the next day thinking that it was a setup as a, you know, somebody was setting me up as a, as a, as a uh, bloopers or practical so you joke. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> only kidding, Bob. So at um, 10 o'clock, I get there, and I, I see Mr. Schnedeker. I meet Pelé. I meet the team. And it turns out they were going on a road trip and needed somebody to, to handle the injured players who were not traveling. Wow. And he explained to me day. that <laughs> I had a job for 10 days. Imagine starting out <laughs> right from the very beginning with the Cosmos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he explained to me that it was it was a 10-day job and I was the only guy who could start the next day and that's the only reason I was there and in 10 days he was going to hire somebody else. I said, well, that's okay. So 10 days came and went and on that last day he said, look, the players like you, I like your work, would you like to stay on? And I was there until the team folded in 1984. How long was that? How long were you with them? I was with them eight years. Wow. Yeah, well, actually, I remember... My son was involved in soccer at that time, and I just used to love going out to watch those Cosmo games. We were, we were driving back on a Wednesday night from a Cosmo game, listening to the uh, Yankee game on the <laughs> way back, and you know, the Yankees had like 20,000 people in the stands, and the Cosmo, we had like 45,000 people on a Wednesday night going down to watch Pele and Shep Messing and all those, you know, all those uh, exciting soccer players because I followed it, you know, because of my son. It was like one of the most exciting sports there ever was. No, we had great fun in those days. Um, there, there was a couple of years where we had averaged sixty-two thousand at a game, and and it was a very vogue thing to do. And we were owned by Warner Communications, and they would always bring in all these stars, recording stars, and and actors and actresses that were doing work for Warner. And so the locker room, you'd always find. Uh, you know, Mick Jagger or, or John Belushi oh or God. somebody. So we had a lot of fun in those days. That sounds incredible. Yeah. Wow. You're listening here to Bob Russo, very, very interesting man. And uh, I think uh, he has a little more to say for us. I also think, Bob, you were with the Arrows from that point. When the, when the, when the Cosmos folded, did we have an indoor soccer league at the time here? We had an, Well, the Cosmos were part of the... The NASL had an outdoor and an indoor league. So with the Cosmos were part of the NASL, we played indoors... We played half our games at Madison Square Garden, half them at Brendan Byrne. And that continued on after the outdoor season for a couple of seasons, and then the whole league folded. What, what do you feel that, that was the problem with the soccer in this country? Well, I, I don't think it was a problem. I think you can't, you can't gauge how soccer was doing by the Cosmos, because the Cosmos had signed the best players in the world, and, and it was a very vogue thing to do in, this, in 79, 80, 81. And we would play to a crowd of, of 65, or, or one night we had actually 78,000 people at Giant Stadium. We hold the record for attendance at Giant Stadium to this day. And, uh, you know, we, we would play a game on Sunday night to that kind of an audience and then go to, you know, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and play to, you know, 2,200. So it wasn't, you know, we were the flagship of the league, so it really wasn't indicative of what soccer was, professional soccer was doing in this country. Hmm. But, you know, we did produce a lot of good players, um, you know, a lot of great American players. And, uh... Yeah, I, I always found it kind of strange, like, all over the world, soccer is, like, everything. I mean, it is a very exciting sport to watch. I, a lot of people that don't know much about soccer, I don't think, give it a chance as to understand it, to see how exciting it is. It's, it's actually the same as it was with uh, tennis with me, until my uh, brother got very much involved in tennis. To me, it was just kind of boring to watch, but the more I got to understand what was happening, it's literally the kind of sport where you can't blink your eye. 
you know, success. Well, it's true. However, we had a reunion about three years ago at Giant Stadium, and Pelé, who was a, a great man, a very gentle man, and a real gentleman, he, he had probably the best soccer court I've ever heard. And he got up and he told our, us and the audience that soccer, they talk about soccer in Europe and South America and how it's not much in the United States. However, the United States is the first country that can boast the fact that the children can say that the mothers played soccer in college and no other country can say that. So it's really, the, the, he and was one of the people responsible for bringing it to the masses of, uh, of, of the, you know, playing public in America. So there's not many countries in South America where the women play soccer. So we really probably have the greatest audience and the greatest amount of participators in that sport. Mm -hmm. oh, something to be said. What do you think, Karen? I think we have a call from Dr. Artie from Forest Hills. Dr. Artie. Hello there. Hello. Hi. How you doing, doctor? Okay, thanks. Well, I'll tell you, I'm a, uh, I'm a tennis nut, actually, you know, speaking of health nuts. <laughs> and I'm a, a sports podiatrist, and I actually wanted to uh, thank Bob Russo for his uh, excellent and insufficiently recognized part in getting Pete Sampras through this year's Davis Cup championship. Some, some job he did there, huh? Yeah, well, he's really sort of an unsung hero, hero, and I'd like to know what he had to do to actually keep Pete on his feet the way he did, because he did a great job and actually won the championship for it. Well, I'd, say I'd like to personally thank him, too, here. Yeah. Yeah, what, what do you think about that? Well, first of all, thank you very much. Did, did you say you were the president of the USTA? <laughs> <laughs> soon, soon. Put that in writing, Doc. <laughs> Actually, um, in, the, in that first match where, where Pete was playing uh, Andrei Chesnikov, it was widely believed that he was suffering from cramps. You know, playing five sets on the clay where the points are very long. and You know, Pete's not used to doing those things. Um, Pete's used to playing very quick matches, usually wins in two sets, uh, you know, the best of three format. Davis Cup is the best of five. And uh, it was widely believed that he was suffering from cramps. And actually, I think he even thought he was suffering from cramps. But, you know, we didn't let a lot of people know outside of the team that Pete actually had a, a mild hamstring pull that I had been treating him for all week. So at 3-1 in the fifth set, when Pete was grabbing his leg and it went over the media and over the, the telecast uh, from ESPN that he had cramps, wasn't exactly right. I was actually preparing to uh, go out on the court and, and wrap his leg for a little support so he could finish the set. And um, what transpired was he finished out the set and, and then reached up in, in jubilation, and that's when he, he actually tore his hamstring a little more severely than uh, we had originally been treating him for. So, uh, you know, we, we, we carried him off the court and we tried to break the pain cycle with, with some ice and, and we gave him treatment that night. And To say Sampras had an uphill battle would be an understatement. He was up two sets to one and seemed to be en route to victory before collapsing in the fourth. Near court, Sampras appears to be tiring out a bit. He stays on the baseline. Now, he had nearly twice as many unforced errors than Chesnikov who would win the tie break and force the deciding fifth set. Match point now in progress. Sampras is top of the screen. Hammering away. And he'll get it done to climax the exhausting marathon and put the U.S. up 1-0. Then his body totally gives out. From elation to fear for the USA team, Sampras, never known to be a cramper, said his whole body was affected. It went totally limp. The two trainers came out and carried him off the court. Scary moment indeed, but he was quickly treated with medication and pills. The next day, Captain Gullickson had asked me to, to give my opinion on whether he would be fit to play the doubles, which he wasn't scheduled to play. And, uh, you know, we said that he was, and, and he went out and he played a great match with Todd Martin. Gullickson benched Richie Renneberg and went back to Pete Sampras in Saturday's doubles match. This despite Sampras leaving the court Friday with severe cramps. With the move pay off, Sampras was back showing no ill effects from the cramps. That's Sampras and Todd Martin in the far court against Andrei Olhovsky and Yevgeny Kafelnikov. The U.S. took the first set 7-5 and they were on their way. Second set. This is the set point. Americans on the near side. Martin with the lob winner. And it was just a matter of time. And uh, the, the Russians were shocked to see him take the court. They had actually written him off thinking that it was cramps for the Sunday's match. And here he comes out uh, 
playing the doubles, which he wasn't supposed to play, and playing excellent. So it all worked out pretty well, and uh, you know we, we stayed on top of his situation all week, and he got a, 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 some good care all week long and, and during the match. So you know he's a professional, and it was really a gallant effort on his part. Well, I think it's a team effort, wouldn't you say, Doc, on on that sort of stuff? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, if, uh, actually, if it wasn't for Bob, I think we probably would have lost the Davis Cup in this way. We got it back to the USA for the first time in a couple of years. Yeah. And that's all she wrote! A win for the USA in the former USSR. The Davis Cup belongs to the United States. Look at the team, Gully, Agassi, Martin, Brennerberg, Russo, so excited, Davis Cup, USA! Doctor, I was at the U.S. Open myself. Uh, you know, Bob uh, very kindly asked me to participate as a massage therapist there, and I'll tell you, there's so much going on behind the scenes that people do not know about. Uh, you know, these players are out there doing their thing, and there's so much going on behind the scenes to make sure that they're in top form, top condition, uh, that, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to appreciate unless you're back there seeing what's actually taking place. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, we see them in the media, we listen to them, and everybody thinks it's just these players doing it and it's it's totally a team effort it's just like putting on a broadway play sometimes it's just too much going on to uh, to explain it and a, and a guy like bob is just you know so valuable that he knows how to put together these uh these you know athletic t these teams to take care of these players it's, it's a bit of a talent and, and in a way maybe makes it look easy but and then again, anybody that's good at what they're doing makes it look easy. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, anyway, just wanted to thank him because, uh, you know, I, I love seeing it come back to the USA. It's a, it's definitely a nice. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, again, say uh, thanks a lot, Bob, for doing such a great job. And, uh, thank you. I don't think thank he's going to quit here either. But, Doctor, thank you very much for your call. Okay. Keep thank listening. You, doctor. Take care, Bob. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. So. Here we are with Bob Russo here, 955-1240, if anybody would like to say hello to Bob. Or, and, um, Bob, um, how was the trip over there? Wasn't that a long flight like? Well, it wasn't as bad as we thought. It was, it was an eight-hour flight. A little dramatic going over because we happened to be, everyone in our cabin was going over for the, uh, for the funeral of the, um, of the Russian skater who had recently passed away. So Scott Hamilton and a, a few of the other skaters... Um, we're in the cabin, so it was a little solemn going over. We got there, and it's what you know. Everyone in the in the uh, country was so hospitable to us. I mean, yeah. unlike we thought, that, you know, the, the Cold War would still be on, but it, it wasn't. We, they they treated us great. The crowd was was great. Blind. Well, I'll tell you what we're going to do, Bob. We're going to take a little bit of a break here, and we're going to come back. And I believe we have somebody very very special on the phone for us here, Shep Messing. And this is going to be a very interesting conversation. Stay here. You're listening to Health Nuts here, Karen and John. 955-1240 if anybody wants to call in. Thank you. Come on back. The most flamboyant and vocal of these is Shep Messing, Bronx-born, Harvard-educated, admitted swinger, a brewer of controversy, who once posed for a nude centerfold, among other exploits. Shep Messing does what he wants when he wants to. After all, he figures it's his life. Now back to Help Nuts. It's 955-1240 here if you want to call us and give us a, a little wrap. We'll answer some questions for you. We're here with Bob Russo from the U.S. Tennis Association. And I believe I have somebody very special waiting for us on the phone, uh, a gentleman I've never spoken to. but seen him play many, many times. His name is Shep Messing. Uh, are you there with us, Shep? I'm with you, guys. How you doing? Hi. Hey, Shep. How you doing? I tell you, this is exciting for me, Shep. I've watched you play uh, with the Cosmos and the Arrows. I followed those two teams all over the place, and I just want to say, uh, you yeah, know, I was kind of excited when I uh, seen a, a Long Island boy out there playing for, uh, you know, the best team probably in the whole country or maybe the world at one time. I don't know. It was pretty exciting, and I'm very, very proud of what you've done, and sure everybody is, Shep. Well, John, I really appreciate that, and, and uh, you know, for, for me, I was one of the pioneers, and I think really it was, you know, I was in the right place at the right time, but, but for... You, John, and Karen, you got the man with you. You got Russo. Hey, My don't, man you, Bobby. don't you think I know that? He, he, I, he's the guy. I haven't seen him in 10 years, so I'll tell you a quick story. And then I, I hear him on the radio today, so I had to call in, but hadn't seen him in 10 years. And I guess it was a week and a half ago, 
I'm on my way to Moscow because I'm with an international sports agency. We represent athletes, and one of them is the captain of the Davis Cup team, Gullickson. Yeah. So, so I land there, you know, a, a 15-hour ride. Hey, forget what Russo tells you. I mean, this is Moscow. This is in <laughs> Los Angeles. <laughs> we, we get off the plane. We get to the hotel. Walk into the lobby. First guy I see, Bob Russo. There's luck. I mean, I was thrilled. I was absolutely thrilled. Bruce, how you doing, my man? I'm doing good, Shep. It was a thrill for me, too. It was a long time I hadn't seen you, and uh, it was just nice to see your face. I got a million things to ask you, and then I'll let you guys, uh, John, Karen, Bob, I mean, obviously ask me anything you want, but, you know, the days when, and I remember that 10-day stint when Russo came in and, and Snedeker called him, and, you know, that was the year we won the championship, and, Listen, sports medicine and training and, and physiology and nutrition, it's changed a lot in the last 20 years. I, I know when I played Ruth, you know, it was a cheeseburger and vodka. And <laughs> I didn't stretch, you know, I'd take a little jog and go on the field. But hey, you did damn yeah, good on that cheese. Yeah, it has changed quite a bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Russo, you're the greatest, you're the greatest. How'd you end up in tennis? I mean, that, that tennis for me in Moscow, you know, Sampras and Courier and Gullickson, that, that was dynamite. I mean, that was really exciting. Yeah, it was a good collection of players we had this time. But, uh, you know, I had been doing tournaments. Ever, even when I was with the Cosmos, I was doing the Open. Uh, there was a, a, a year when, when uh, Vitas Gerolaitis and John McEnroe, Jimmy Connors, Lendl weren't part of the ATP, so the union wouldn't provide them with training services. So they called, uh, they called on me to, uh, to come to work the first U.S. Open. And all I had to do was take care of those five guys. So I don't know. I, went, I don't know what was better, working for the Cosmos, who was great, or, or the tennis. But it's, all, it's worked out pretty well. Well, you know, you really, and I think John mentioned it, you, you're one of the best kept secrets around because you're, the international scope of the athletes that you've taken care of in your career is, uh, is really unbelievable. I mean, from, from Pelé and Beckenbauer and Canalia and... Messing? Yeah. Well, people don't realize, Shep, that as an American player, you're not only a great goalkeeper, but you really changed that position. You made it an attacking position, which it never had been. And nobody in South America, Europe, uh, figured that out, that, well, that it was effective as an attacking position, except for you. You know, I am, I am really modest, though. I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult to do anything wrong when you have Beckenbauer and Canelli and Pelé and, and, and these guys in front of you. But... But yes, I think if you take a point guard in basketball, or you take a shortstop in baseball, an American kid, and you put him in the goal, he's going to play that position aggressively, which is what I tried to do. Uh, you know, come out to the top of the box and try and break up things before it became uh, too late. Before you got broken up. <laughs> well, then I call up my man Bobby. But yeah. Even Russo <laughs> saw me in Moscow. I'm in Moscow, and these guys are going out to the Kremlin and Red Square. And I'm sitting in the room, Bruce. I never went out. You know that. No, it's true. And I ordered out cheeseburgers. I must have had 15 cheeseburgers in Moscow. Yeah, you're it's kidding true. me, right? You never right? left the room. <laughs> no, no, um, it's true. But you know, it was a thrill for me, Bob, to see to see these. I call them kids, but Sampras and, and, and Courier. These guys are fit. I mean, yeah. it, takes, it takes an awful lot. And and like you mentioned, you know, it's different in tennis. If that doctor comes on the court, their history so. I saw a lot of responsibility that, that you had. Oh, thank you. And, uh, hey, you got to be doing something right. I hope so, yeah. Hey, Chef, i got a question for you. Sure. I, I, I didn't expect to do this, Steve, but you think that maybe you'd have a little time if you come on the show with us a little bit and rap about what's going on. I want to talk to you about the soccer stuff and, and just, you know, you have, you're have you an abundance of information. Your name pops up every now and again among some of my uh, clients, and um, you know, I just would like to know if you'd like to give it a shot one day. Well, Russo's my man. If he says, Shep, do this show, they're good people, it would be my pleasure. Okay. Well, Shep, you got the green light. <laughs> How, however, I'd like to ask you to do something for, for, uh, that would be uh, beneficial to everybody on Long Island. Sorry you made the well. call, Shep. <laughs> <laughs> I'm involved with uh, the Musculoskeletal Institute, uh, an affiliate of North Shore University, which was founded, uh, Musculoskeletal Institute, founded by uh, Dr. Eugene Krauss. And we're putting together a board of advisors of professional athletes and ex-professional athletes. And we would be honored to have your expertise and uh, your input on our board to advise us on some of the things that we could do for some of the you know, young and up-and-coming athletes on Long Island who are looking to you know, train the proper way and, and become as, success as successful as you are. Well, I, Bobby, I mean, it would be my pleasure. It would be an honor to, to, to help you and help them in any way I can if it's it's being on an advisory board, that, that'd be great. I mean, what are the plans? What are they doing? 
Well, we're, we, uh, we have a network of facilities, uh, building a flagship facility that's in its final stages at 825 Northern Boulevard. We're going to be doing a number of outreach programs, going into the schools, and uh, our, our physicians are, are care for the uh, New York Islanders. And we'll be doing, you know, 10K runs and, and trying to provide athletic training and medical services to, to the populations of Long Island and Nassau and Suffolk. And uh, we want to give something back. We want to, uh, you know, give everyone the best opportunity to take care of themselves or, you know, rehabilitation. Or if you need, uh, you know, surgery, we have some of the best specialists in the country uh, at, the, at the Institute. So uh, Let me tell you this, Bob. First of all, if you're involved, you know, they got a great asset. And I think we're all involved in sports. And listen, the, the beauty of sports, and that's for you, Bob, and me, and, and John and Karen, is, you know, it sort of transcends you know, race and politics and economics and, and there are lots of things that are good that can come out of it. And this is one of them, Bob. So, I mean, be my pleasure as long as I don't have to run a, a, this 10K. That's no, the, you don't have to run the 10K. <laughs> you know, we are, you know, we're all involved in sports and, and athletics from, from Bob to you, Karen, and John and myself. And, you know, it's, it's a great world. A lot of good could come out of it. And, uh, Listen, I think this is a good show you're doing. It just I, it blew my mind because I'm, I'm driving, and I heard you on the radio after just having seen this guy last week. And you got you to gotta have him tell you about his picture in Sports Illustrated. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, it was a cover shot? <laughs> it, was, it was supposed to be the cover shot. I, oh, really? I lost out to Pat Riley, though. Oh, that's incredible. <laughs> well, geez, Shep, thank you so much for the phone call. Shep, was good speaking to you, and I'll, I'll be in touch. Bob, we'd, we'd, we'd love to have you at the Institute. I'm glad to have you on board. Listen, it, it'd be my pleasure. I'd love to do it. Uh, you know, good luck with the show, guys. We're gonna Thanks be for a, calling. Yeah, we're going to be in touch with you, Chef, okay? John and Karen, I'd love to come on. Bob, yeah. you are the man, really. Okay. Hey, you know thanks what? So much. No, you're the man. No, without you, I would have retired 15 years ago. You, <laughs> you gave me an extra an extra eight years. So. Uh, we're going to get another 50 out of you once we get you off those cheeseburgers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Okay. Chef, have a good holiday. Thanks, Chef. Good, Bob. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Well, I tell you, that's, that guy's incredible. He yeah. really was. And you see him now, he's 46 years old. He's got the body of a 20-year-old. We're here with Bob Russo from the U.S. Tennis Association. You can speak to us at 955-1240. And I wanted to get in a little bit with how how did how did you get really involved with the U.S. Tennis Association or, or the, the U.S. Open? How did that come about? Well, like I mentioned before, I was, um, I was called... By the, by the USTA to take care of some players uh, who weren't part of the association. I knew I was a local trend, knew I was with the Cosmos. And it just kind of grew from there. Uh, you know, I, I liked working with tennis. I was always uh, around tennis. I grew up just a few blocks from the uh, West Side Tennis Club in Forest Hills. And, um, you know, I remember, uh, you know, where I worked there all my life, practically when I was going to school. And I used to, you know, r bring my books to work and study uh, when it was, uh, you know, uh, quiet time and, and, and used to dream about being a trainer in tennis and never, and I, I knew it was out of the question. So it just kind of unraveled. I was, you know, very lucky in the right place at the right time. But, you know, I knew my craft and I got along good with the guys. So I've been around for almost 20 years. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah. In fact, it was the, the, the recent Davis Cup in, was the first time the United States had played Russia in the final. And, uh, but for me, I had played that so many times because we used to, as employees, we were allowed to use the courts behind the stadium, you know, when, on our day off. So, you know, because we were at Forest Hills, we knew a lot about tr tennis tradition and, you know, Davis Cup and, you know, which, which a lot of people don't, you know, realize about this international competition. So we used to go out, my, my friend Matt and I used to go back there and play tennis and we would always say, you know, well, this is the Davis Cup Finals. You know, I'm the USA, and, and, and I'm Russia. Or, or Instead I'm of Australia. playing guns, you were out there playing... Uh, yeah, we were pretending that we were on US the Davis, uh, Davis Cup team. Davis and, Cup and team, yeah. you know, in the 60s, it was always... That was the big rivalry. You know, U.S.-Russia, you know, in the, the kennedy Khrushchev and, you know... Yeah, right, right. Chaos right. and control and, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so I played that final uh, many times in my dreams. So if I could pass anything down to my children is that, you know, dreams really do come true. I was true. just going to say. They really do. True. Although in you my dream... You have to be patient, though. You, you have to be take a while. You have to be patient. But in my dream, I served the winning ace down the middle that won the match that clinched the cup. So Sampras has part of my dream, but I'm part of the mix, so, you know, I have to... So you're involved in some way. Well, yeah, yeah it's close <laughs> enough. I mean, you know, time's running out, so... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I got to take what I can get. <laughs> 
<laughs> you seem to be getting quite a bit. I think you're getting some. Yeah, money. I've been very lucky and very fortunate to be on uh, a number of teams. Winning, uh, w winning teams, three, three championships with the Cosmos and three Davis Cup championships. I mean, it's a pretty good career so far. Um, it was a little anticlimactic in Russia. It was dramatic, and, and it was a thrill to, 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 to be on that winning team. But, you know, when you play away from home, it doesn't have the celebration yeah. at the yeah. end. I mean, the, the, yeah. the crowd is polite and they clap, but they're also disappointed. Mm -hmm. It was much different in, when we won in 1990. Australia in the final in uh, in St. Petersburg, and it was right before the Persian Gulf War. So you had 22 or 23,000 people waving American flags, and you know they were playing Lee Greenwood's uh, "Proud to Be an American" over the loudspeakers, and it brought us all out on the court. It was very emotional. It wasn't a dry eye in the place. This was kind of low keyed and um, kind of Russian. It was kind of Russian. Yeah, it was kind of <laughs> cold. <laughs> yeah, but it was, but it was still an incredible experience. You probably uh, will remember the rest of your life. I sure will. It was, it was a great win. And it was one of those. Uh, Home runs at the bottom of the ninth with the bases loaded. That's you know, right. With yeah. What you've done, it's, yeah. it's, it's incredible to be a part of that. And uh, you know, it's now it's on to other things. So. If you're looking for something to do this weekend, there's one thing that will not only be informative and fun, but you might be able to get an autograph from some of your favorite sports stars. This September will be the 10th anniversary of the death of Vitas Garolitis. When not on the court, this tennis great used his free time to teach children the game he loved through his youth foundation that bears his name. To give back. And he said, Peter, I'll get the players. You know, I'll make calls, and I know you know them as well because you used to play on tour. Why don't you start coordinating with the parks departments? Let's see if we can do some clinics and give something back to the city. I grew up in the public parks, and I'd like to do that. And he did it without any fanfare and he, he did it with uh, you know without looking for publicity I mean it was you know very common for Vetus to get up on a Saturday morning and go up to some park in you know uh, East New York or you know or up in Harlem and you know spend three or four hours teaching you know young kids how to play tennis we were just trying to carry on his work in some way in our own way to you know pay him tribute and um, and so that's why I think we have such great support. Support by the New York Jets, Islanders, and New York Sport Time, among others, has made it possible for Bob Russo of Pro Health, a medical practice in Lake Success, to hold its family health fair. Already in its seventh year, tomorrow's events being held at Roosevelt Field Mall will give people a chance to meet some of the biggest stars in professional sports. And we have John McEnroe coming, and you know, a number of the Jets and the Islanders and the Dragons and a few other tennis celebrities, and we'll have health care information for the young, for the old. So we want to reach out to the people, so if anybody wants a little information, they could certainly contact me any, any time Monday to Friday and, and let me know what it's about, and I'd be happy to meet with them and explain our programs and what we could do for, for the uh, people of Long Island. And we want to reach out. We want to be the the leader in caring for individuals on, on uh, oh, I tell you, Bob, it's Long great. Island, yeah, it's a super place. And if you're involved, then it's definitely going to be a good program. Oh, it's I'm sure these people you've mentioned are top, top shelf individuals. Well, you know, I've had so many offers all, and I, all over the country, for, you know, for to do things like this. And it's not about building an empire or it's not about, you know... No ego trips. No you. ego trips. It's, uh, 
it, it, people really care. It, it's, yeah. it's a genuine bunch of great guys and, and really know their stuff and they're the top flight. But just to know that there's something like this on Long Island, I'm not only proud of it because this is really a special place. A lot of people downplay Long Island and uh, we have some incredible athletes. We were on the phone with Al Lauder last week. There's like a man that you know, has yet to be duplicated, an incredible athlete. You got Shep Messing. We have uh, John McEnroe, uh, McEnroe, Jeannie Mayer, Carl Yastrzemski, Vinny Call, Testaverde. I mean, oh, this has been a this tremendous amount. It's an incredible amount. place to live. It, it really is. is. So if I could pass anything down to my children, is that you know dreams really do come true? I was true. just going to say they really do. True. We're here with uh, Bob Russo from the US, U.S. Tennis Association. We heard a, an excellent uh, story of how Bob got involved and what he's doing right now. He's involved with the uh, North Shore Musculoskeletal Institute, and I know that's something that uh, Long Island has to be proud of. We have a lot to be proud of in Bob himself, and we're hoping that uh, he continues with uh, the U.S. Tennis Association. At least I'm hoping personally that he does. He was so kind to have me work at the U.S. Open, and uh, you know, hopefully I'll get another chance to do that again. But it was I great will, having you. Yeah, thank you very much for having me there, and thank you very much for being on the show today. No, it was my pleasure. You added an incredible uh, quality to the show, even though we have cameras. Thanks, so. Bob. Oh, and, uh, thank you. Thank you very Karen. much. We'll be seeing you again, Bob. Yeah, I'd uh, love to come back, and if anybody has we any questions... We can talk about nutrition next time. We can talk a little Something about nutrition. Something I know a little yeah. bit about. That's right. And everybody, don't forget to tune in next week here at, uh, at WGBB, 1240 AM radio, and uh, you can give us a call.